pray. God, we come and we are so grateful for your love and your kindness toward us. You are high and lifted up, and we do cry, holy, 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 for you are the one that is holy. And God, you've called us to be holy. God, we come this morning, God, with open hearts and open minds, wanting to hear from you. God, we pray right now that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, that we might be different. God, some of us have been weighed down all week, Lord, by the burdens of our everyday life. God, we come to have those burdens lifted today. God, we come to be different today. God, we need you today. Speak to us today. God, we are so grateful for another opportunity, God, to hear from you. Now, God, we ask right now, Lord, that you would set aside this time, Lord, to speak to us. God, our hearts are open, our ears are open. Speak that we might hear. To the end, God, that we might be different than when we came. Yeah. God, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God is good. Praise God for the praise team. Amen. 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 Uh, I wish I could sing. Amen. But my friend won't even let me try to sing. And we praise God. Amen. We have been journeying. First of all, welcome to each and every one of you guys who come and spend a little time with us on this first Sunday in July. And uh, we have been uh, journeying through the book of Acts uh, since September. And uh, it is my ambition today that we kind of wrap things up as we uh, continue to push forward in this study. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about a subject that many people are, are a little weary of, and that's commitment, amen? Uh, commitment seems to be uh, almost like a cuss word to us, amen? We don't want, don't box me in, you know, don't, don't lock me up, oh no, I don't want to get locked into anything, I, I want to be able to uh, express myself and do my thing, amen? Even when we have jobs that are very strict on how we go about our business, you know, those of us that are scared of commitment, that kind of feels funny. Those of us, even in marriage today, when they make marriage vows, they want to make sure that those marriage vows don't kind of get me locked in. What do you mean? Love and what? Oh, but, oh, excuse me. No, no, no. I got to make my own stuff so I can have some loopholes. Amen? Amen? And it often translates to our life with Christ. Christ has already laid out um, the course of how we should live and how we should serve and how we should love and how we are to display our faith. But we're looking for those loopholes. So today we're talking about being committed to your call. Committed to your call. And uh, like I've told you over these months, we've been walking through the word. When you hear that word called, don't check out because you're not a preacher. Don't check out because you're not a minister. Because everybody who has a relationship with Christ has a call on their lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm a Raider fan. Amen. I'm a Raider fan. And I know that um, many people might find that ironic that, you know, preacher who love God is a Raider fan, but I am a Raider fan, silver and black baby all day long, amen? amen. I don't think Dennis is a Raider fan, but he wears silver and black, I'm going to take it today, amen? And one thing I love about being a Raider fan, especially if you Raider, was a Raider fan in the 70s and 80s, is Al Davis's A number one slogan. And it's a number one slogan that's known not just by Raider fans, but known across people who love football, is a commitment to excellence. Now, I know that sounds a little oxymoronic, considering the fact that we haven't had much excellence lately. But the point is that he gave them a vision of excellence. And that vision of excellence is tied to commitment. Amen? Listen here. Uh, in this uh, Bleacher Report about the Raiders, this quote, Vision without action is just a dream. 
Action without vision just passes the time. But vision and action can change the world. In this Bleacher Report on the Raiders, it also says this, a compelling organizational vision of 10 attracts people to its pursuit because it challenges and it's, it's challenging and it's important. It touches the hunger for meaning that resides in all of us. It energizes and motivates those who choose it at a deep level. It serves as a guide and pathway for decisions and actions in the face of an unknowable future. It also provides the emotional inspiration that keeps people engaged in their pursuits. Even when the going gets tough, as it inevitably does, insignificant undertakings. Vision is important. Al Davis' vision was that he would have a team that was committed to excellence. And one of those tests for uh, commitment for excellence was another one in slogans. Just win, baby. So he was able to judge if his team was committed to excellence. One of those criteria was the fact that when we won, when we did what we were supposed to do. And again, I give this disclaimer. As a Raider fan, we haven't had much uh, just win babies going on. So what does commitment to excellence have to do with us as believers? See, Christ calls us, just like Al called them to vision, God has given us a vision through his son, Jesus Christ. That vision is the ministry of service and commitment to spreading the good news of salvation. Our level of commitment, and this is one thing I want you to get into your head today, our level of commitment is tied to our level of sacrifice. See, commitment has to take action. You just can't say the words. Recently, uh, Frank and uh, Melissa got married. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, for that. And many of us that are, are married, some of us remember that, that day. Amen. So, brothers, you better remember that day. And uh, we remember making those vows before God. And those vows are kind of lofty. Amen. They're lo lofty. In sickness and hell, I'm with you. Amen. But when we make those vows, we're making a commitment. It's no, it does, it's irrelevant if you make the vows and the next day you go back to doing everything you want to do. It's irrelevant if you make those vows and you go back to living a single life. It's irrelevant to, to make those vows and you continue to operate as one instead of two becoming one. Your actions, your sacrifice will indicate your level of commitment. Amen? We often say, hey, I love God to death. He is the center of my life. He is the great man upstairs. I, I really love him. But when we look at your life, does it show that you have any commitment? Now, I'm committed to my job. Many of us are committed to the paycheck. But that job, because of my commitment to it, compels me to be there for every time I'm supposed to be there. It compels me to be there because I'm making the sacrifice so that I may earn money, so that I may take care of not only myself but my family. So that I can make the sacrifice to be there at times I may not be there, to deal with bosses I can't stand, to go on commutes that's too long for me to keep my sanity, to deal with all kinds of circumstances because at the end, I have a goal in mind, a vision of my family being taken care of. Well, when we look at the scripture, God gives us vision. We've been looking at action from chapter 19 all the way through chapter 28. We see the apostle Paul fulfilling the vision that God had given him, fulfilling the call that God had placed on his life. Paul understood that commitment takes action. It gives, it lays down, it lifts up, amen? It prioritizes, it adds, it deletes. Commitment necessitates change, amen? Amen. amen. Paul displayed a commitment to that vision. As we conclude our study of Acts, we will see how Paul's commitment can serve as an inspiration as an inspiration to us to have a greater, deeper, better commitment to 
Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's look at Acts 28. We're going to look at Acts 28, and then we're going to back our way into the rest of this book. I'm ambitious today. We're going to wrap it up and put a bow tie on it. Amen? Amen. 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 And at the end, if the Lord said the same, we'll be different. Let's look at Acts 28. I'm going to start at uh, verse 17. Verse 17. Amen. Just bear with me. It's a little long, but we don't get there. Verse 17, Acts 28 says this. After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews. And when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no ground for putting me to death. No ground for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I am requested to see you and speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we do desire to hear from you what your views are for concerning this sect. It is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. Verse 23, when they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at the lodging in large numbers. And he had explained to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets. From morning until evening, some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others would not believe. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word. Check this out. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your father, saying, Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. And go down to verse 30. It says this, And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness and unhindered. These verses speak to the end of Paul's journey. Paul had had a journey that started in Acts 9. And in Acts 9, we find uh, Paul on a Damascus road going with papers to persecute some Christians, to lock some folk up. And the Lord knocked him off his high horse and revealed to him the message that he had for him and what he must do for him. He told Paul, through his prophet Ananias, that Paul, you will be my witness. Amen. You will be my witness to the Gentiles. You will be my witness before kings. You will be my witness before your people. Amen. And then God went about laying that out, and Paul committed to his call. Paul was willing to do whatever it took to commit to his call. We find that Paul, as he walked through doing what God had called him to do, he was willing to lay down his life on his missionary journeys. We found him over and over again in trouble. Amen. For proclaiming 
God's message, but he was committed to his call. Paul did not uh, cower at the fact that many had decided to take his life. This same Paul who uh, we're looking at today was a Paul that was imprisoned because of his call. He was beaten because of his call. He was alienated because of his call. He had to have brothers and sisters in the church question the authenticity of his relationship with Jesus Christ because of his call. And he continued to preach, to teach, and to reach. Amen? Let's back up again to Acts chapter 20, which we read a couple weeks ago. In verse 24, where Paul says again, I, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus Christ, to testify solemnly of the gospel of grace of God. Now when we looked at that, I talked about the fact that he received his call from Jesus Christ himself. Many of you sitting here today may say, hey, well my name ain't Paul. Amen. I'm not no apostle. I'm not no prophet. Amen. But God has given you an individual call. And you need to, if you don't know what God has called you to do, you need to ask yourself or ask God, show me what you have called me to do. I had a co-worker uh, on yesterday. She was talking about what uh, she used to do in the church. You know how we do it. Back in the day, oh, when I didn't have to work all these hours when I was really serving God. You know, she talked about the fact that she felt good when she was ushering. She felt good when they were actually doing a small group at her house. She felt good when she was fellowshipping with the other sisters and they were talking about uh, the Lord Jesus. Now she has been resigned to uh, going to uh, uh, church every blue moon. She said, no, no, I'll make it in the church, but I just can't do nothing for the church. No, I make it to service on Sunday, but I just can't serve. And one thing I told her, I, and she said this, and I don't understand my purpose anyway. And I was like, wow, you understand your purpose? I said, have you ever asked God about your purpose? No, not really. And I told her, I, I shared with her just some points from the scripture about all of us have a purpose. All of us have a call. All of us, God has given us talents, gifts, and, and, and spiritual gifts and experiences, amen, to be used within the body of Christ so that we can be used outside the walls. Now what God does, and, and, and I'll get back to her, what God does, he takes our gifts, our talents, all our treasures, all those things that we develop in the church so that we can be used outside the church. Now understand this, this is like for football players, this is uh, that Monday night when we come, at uh, Monday, when we come in and review film. I know ladies, uh, it's a sports analogy, but uh, some of you who play sports, you understand when your coaches tell you, we got to review what we've been doing so we can do it better. When we come to church, we come, we review a meal. Well, how was your life this week? How did you do this week? Let me give you a word of instruction from the Lord to help you that when you walk out this door, you'll be better equipped to handle what you have to do on Monday. And when you come back next Sunday, I'm going to do what I got to do to equip you to go outside the door. And when we are serving outside the doors, Monday through Saturday, we are taking what we learn from the scripture and applying it in our daily lives so that we can make a difference in the lives of others. Amen? In some churches today, all it is is a huddle and a ride ride and a cheer cheer only for what's going on in here. Amen? But if you look at the Bible, the mission is about what goes on outside the four walls. Amen? Church is to equip us, to teach us, to get us ready for the battle. Amen? Many of us would love just to stay right here and we don't have to get touched by the world. No, 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 no. We are assigned to the world. Jesus had to go out into the world. He was born into the world. Us, we have to serve in the world. He says, listen, I'm not going to take you out the world. Amen? You've got to stay in the world. But while you're in the world, you will be salt and light. Amen? 
So she said, ah, my coworker, ah, well, I don't know what God's voice is. He don't speak to me. I said, well, first of all, if you want to hear his voice, open up his word. Amen. Amen. This is, this is the, the first thing we need to do is open up. You want to hear from God? You want to understand your purpose? Search his scripture. Amen. The Bible, he, he actually challenges, search me. Amen. Search me. If you want to know him, search him. Amen. He is discoverable. He is right here in his word. And then she was like, okay, I'll, I'll read. I said, wait a minute, not just only uh, the scripture. He sends those who know him. He sends wise counsel. He sends those who know God to come alongside and speak to you. And I ain't talking about every time we can hear it that says, I got a word from the Lord. Because everybody who says they got a word from the Lord don't have a word from the Lord. Most times it's a word from them. Amen. But the scripture tells us, try to by the Spirit. If somebody's coming to you and they're telling you what thus says the Lord, and it's contrary to the Word, then you know this counter. If somebody's coming to you and telling you something contrary to what you know, God has already told you to do. Amen? You need to trust your relationship with God. But God sends others. Not only does He send others, check this out. We have something special that the world does not have. Those of us that are in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And believe me, he testifies to us what's right and wrong. Some of us say, well, I heard a voice, you know, in my, you know, in my mind, my conscience said, no, it wasn't your conscience. It was God's Spirit speaking to you, telling you, don't go that way. I have another way for you. Amen. So I was sharing with her, we all have a purpose. How uh, disheartening it is when we go around without purpose. If you think your purpose is only to go to a job every day for 25 to 30 years, earn a retirement, and sit on the side of a pool, and then you're sorely mistaken. If you think that your only purpose is to be good parents to your children and raise them right, you are sorely mistaken because we know your children don't disappoint you. Your children don't make mistakes, amen? That's not your only purpose. If you think your purpose is just to be a good person, you're sorely mistaken because the Bible says there is no one good but God. Amen? Our purpose comes from knowing our relationship with Jesus Christ and knowing what he says our purpose is. There are people who you'll never know their name, who are walking out their purpose for Jesus Christ. Amen. Their name is not in the lights. Their names are on no boards or certificates. They are serving God by doing what they're called to do. Amen. There's people serving God more diligently in the kitchen ministry than folks that are standing in the pulpits. Amen. There are people serving God anonymously more than those who are looking for a claim. Amen. My point is, we all have a call and we must be committed to that call. Paul was not even worried about, said, I don't even consider my life anything. Amen. When he wrote the Philippians, he told him, listen, I consider all my accomplishments as though we see Paul as he goes through several trials toward the end of his journey. He tells him, listen, uh, y'all friend me, I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I studied under the best teacher in Jerusalem. Amen. I had big respect. I had all the certificates. Amen. You call me Dr. PhD MD Paul. Amen. He said, I had all that stuff. But in light of my relationship with Jesus Christ, in light of the calling that is on my life, I consider that rubbish. Some scriptures say it's less than rubbish. He said, I consider it dumb. It's nothing. Amen? What are we willing to consider rubbish? Are we holding on so tight to our accomplishments that we can't do what God has called us to do? Amen? When we talk about our call, it's a God-giving call, and God has given us everything we need to answer that call. Amen? Paul was willing to die. Then we looked at last week when Paul's good friends 
so-called were trying to help him as we talked about having an unshakable faith. His friends were like, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, they're going to get you. Amen. If you go to Jerusalem, they're going to lock you up. Lock you up. Paul said, listen, I'm not even, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not only willing to be locked up in chains, I'm willing to die. Amen. I know some of y'all got all excited with Biggie Small said ready to die, but he didn't know nothing about really being ready to die. It was Paul. It was Jesus. It was those who were committed to Christ. I ain't ready to die for no foolishness. I'm ready to die for what God has given me. I'm not ready to die for no soul, for no neighborhood, for no garbage. I'm ready to give my life to the one who gives life. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Paul said, I am willing to die. He said, I understand, friends. Y'all trying to keep me from going to Jerusalem. You concerned about me? He said, but God already showed me what was waiting for me in Jerusalem. But I must go. My question remains to us. What's your Jerusalem? Where is God calling you to go? And you so scared, you shaking in your boots. What decisions God is calling you to make? Amen. But you're unwilling to make because it doesn't line up with your five-year plan. What decisions God is calling you to make? What commitments God is calling you to make? But it doesn't line up with how you feel or what you want and all those things. Paul said, I'm committed to God's call. I'm willing to do whatever it took. When God called Paul, he told him that you will testify to me before your people, before kings, amen, before the Gentiles. And that's exactly what Paul did. Let's look at the scripture. We see in uh, Acts 23, we find Paul before the council. Paul makes his way back to Jerusalem. And when he goes to Jerusalem, just like uh, the prophet Agabus had told him that he would be locked up, just like the Lord told him before the prophet Agabus uh, that Paul would be locked up, we see it actually coming and taking place. Paul strolls in to Jerusalem. He first goes to the church at Jerusalem. You know, they have a little uh, flashback. They, they're chit-chatting. They're talking about his missions and all those things. And they, they kind of reiterate to him, hey, Paul, word got back to us. You, you're kind of kicking up nuts. I'm, I'm sorry. You're kind of making a, a, a mess of things. You, you, you're kind of stirring some stuff up. Amen. And, and Paul says, wait a minute. I'm doing what God Call me to do it. Like, like we, we understand, Paul. Well, why don't you do this? See, we got some guys going to the temple to make some vows. You go down with them because they, they've been telling the folk that you preaching against Moses. You preaching against the fathers. You doing all this. And, and Paul's like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I'm not doing that. I'm preaching about the one who fulfills the law of Moses. I'm preaching about the one that the fathers, that the prophets proclaimed. Amen. But again, he gets Paul locked up. This is what Paul says before them. Let's go to uh, 22, chapter 22. I'm sorry, 23. And this is what Paul tells them, 23, 6. He says, but, but perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other group Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees, I'm on trial for the hope of the resurrection of the dead. See, Paul goes before the council, and we've learned many, many months ago that the council, the Sanhedrin council, was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees. Sadducees were considered the political movers and shakers. Amen? They were the ones that liked power and money. Amen? They loved to get the cash, so they would position themselves with those governing bodies so that they can get all they can. You know, we got politicians today that are Sadducees, amen? All they want are concerned. They're not really concerned with serving the people. They're concerned with making sure they line their pockets up right. They give you a cover story. God bless you, sister. I'm here for you. I'm here to serve you. At the same time, they're making sure they get those $10,000 a plate uh, donations, amen? And when you say, wait a minute, it's still all the potholes in my neighborhood. What happened to that money? 
Oh, don't worry, we're working on the next campaign. And on the next campaign, we're going to make sure we get everything. Amen? That's the side you see, the political shakers. Then we have the Pharisees. Those were the religious folks. You spoke to a Pharisee, in their eyes, it was like you were speaking to God himself. They understood, not only did they know the law, they understood the law. They took those uh, brief laws that, that God gave Moses in Exodus and took them and turned that into almost 600 laws. Amen? Certain laws that, and what those laws were meant to do, not just to control the people, but to dictate how holy they were. Right. So when you saw a Pharisee walk through town, you go, oh, wow, they're holy. I don't go over there. They're holy. And we got people like that today. They got preachers today. They're so holy, you can't even come in there around. Oh, no, I can't shake your head. I, and you might take my anointing. Amen. You know, no, no, no. When, when, if you want to talk to me, to me, even though I'm your pastor, when you talk to me, you got to talk to the secretary of the uh, uh, administrative pastor, and then the administrative pastor talks to the secretary of the executive pastor, then the executive pastor talks to the executive secretary, to the assistant of the pastor, then if I got time, then I might give you five minutes. Oh no, Sunday morning, you can't know, I disappeared. Amen? No, God's people uh, have access to him, amen, to the man of God. But the Pharisees were the upper echelon, the religious folk. If you notice Jesus' three-year, this three-year ministry, he battled with the Pharisees quite a bit. Because in Jesus' eyes, you Pharisees who know the Old Testament front, back, side to side, who are able to quote, amen, not only the law, but also the prophets, you should know who I am. You Pharisees who are so religious, you Pharisees are so-called men of prayer, men of God, you should know me. But Jesus told them this, and this is for free. He said, you Pharisees, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. You know what a whitewashed sepulcher is? A painted casket. You like pretty caskets full of dead man's bones. You look like you fit the part all on the outside, but on the inside, you're dead. He said, you have the one who is able to make you live right before you, and you don't even recognize me. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so it's not surprising that the Pharisees were one of those groups constantly going after Christians, constantly going after the ones that Jesus called to serve him. Amen? And these Pharisees were supposed to be religious. So Paul does this. One thing that's different from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believe that that's a fantasy. But the Pharisees do. So when Paul said, I'm on trial for the hope and the resurrection, the Pharisees kind of, ooh, wait a minute. The Sadducees got upset, and they started arguing amongst themselves. Amen? Paul was before these who wanted to do harm with him. So after he said this, the Pharisees said, hey, we don't find nothing wrong with this brother. He's all right. Amen? So the council kind of backed off of him. But check this out. After he went to the council, these men come to the high priest, 40 of them, and say, you know what? We don't like this brother Paul. We don't like these Christians and what they're doing. We are taking a vow that we will not eat until we kill him. Forty men took a vow and said, we're going to track Paul down and we're not going to eat till we kill him. Well, we know in Acts they must have been dead because they didn't catch up to him. Amen. Amen. But listen, Paul stood even in the face of danger, even in the face of conspiracy, he stood his ground and stood on the word of God. Then they moved Paul to Caesarea. It tells you, let me tell you how dangerous the scripture is to some who don't believe. Look at this. This is just a little Paul. Verse 23 of chapter 23 says this. When they moved him to Caesarea, it says this. And he called to him two of the centurions and said, and this is the official, 
It says, get 200 soldiers ready by the third hour of the night to proceed to Caesarea with 70 men and 200 spearmen. They were also to provide mounts to put Paul on and bring him safely to Felix. So what it's saying here is, they got all these men to protect Paul so that Paul can get to where he needed to go. Amen? The scripture says that Paul was going to testify before a king. He's on his way to a king right now. And this same Roman Empire that we'll find out later on persecuted many, many Christians. God used them to deliver Paul to every place he needed to go. We're talking about hundreds of men. God used hundreds of, of Gentiles, hundreds of professional soldiers to deliver his apostle. Amen? Amen? So many of us, let's bring that to what we're doing right now. Many of us are concerned about what God is going to do for us. How God is going to protect us. How God is going to help us. If he gives Paul four or five hundred soldiers, if, 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 imagine what he can do for your situation. Yeah. Imagine what your situation looks like in God's eyes. Some of us feel like our situations are unsurmountable. Look, preacher, I ain't facing death. I ain't never been locked up for the Bible or for being a Christian, but I feel like I'm shackled up by my circumstances. I'm shackled up, you know, amen, by what's going on in my home. I feel shackled up by what's going on in my job. I feel like I just can't make it. And God, just like he did for Paul, he can do the same thing for you and set you free. Yeah. Yeah. God has a desire for us to walk in those gifts and callings. All we have to do is commit to him. See, many of us, we get distracted because we look at the change. We get distracted because we look at the situation. When you look at Paul, Paul is saying, I'm determined to do what God called me to do no matter what. Some of us, we know exactly what God has called us to do. Some of us, God has told us to go and go be a blessing to your boss. No, I can't stand my boss. It's a reason we keep coming back to this boss thing, amen? We got to believe I can't stand my boss. And, and God is telling you, you need to be light to your boss. You need to be salt to your boss. You're the only thing preserving that office. I've got you there for a strategic reason so that you can be a blessing to those that are lost. So that you can show there is a hope in Jesus Christ. Some of us in our, our marriage relationship, we're just struggling just to make it. And God is like, I call, I ordained marriage. I set it apart as a, a, a picture of my relationship with my church through my son. Amen? And if you commit to what I called you to commit, I'm going to take care of you. But God, I don't see it. I can't stand her. She can't stand me. Amen? Only thing that's keeping us together is the front door. And God is saying, if you lock the front door, I'll work on what's inside. Amen. If you, if you look at me as the only option, I'll fix it. If you let me. But see, we get impatient with God. Because God doesn't work on our timetable. Amen. God has a call on all our lives. And we must be committed to follow that call. And following that call takes us to obeying what he's called us to do. Paul obeyed no matter what. Then if they, if, the, if Corona PD or Ismail PD pulled up in the lot and said all Christians going to jail today, we'd be like, I don't know what they're doing up in that church. I just came in here to see what was going on. Amen. I, I, can't, I can't go to jail. Anybody who said they don't know Jesus, you get to go free. I heard of Jesus before, but I don't belong to him. Amen. Which door is this? Can we go out this way? Am I clear? I ain't got nothing to know you. Amen. We didn't even think, and we're not even at that point yet. But we got brothers and sisters in Christ around the world where it's right there, right now. Amen. That are giving their lives for this faith. God has called you to give up some of your habits. And we're like, no, oh God, that habit is good. God has called us to give up some of your friends. He's not even, he not even asking you right now to be put in check. Just you got to let that one go. No, God, we're going to wait back. Uh, he 
says, but, but before you were even born, I already knew you. Yes, sir. I already knew you. How far? How, did y'all go back farther than me and you? Because yeah. I knew you before the foundation of the earth. I knew what I had for you. That one must go. Yeah. Amen. But don't all I mean, my God, we, we grew up together. They know my mama, they don't know. If they don't go, they're going to hinder your relationship with me. And some of us, you'll be surprised when we let go of that thing of that person that God tells us to let go, we'll find out that He got greater blessings for us on the way. Amen. <laughs> but we are willing to let those things go. But God has a call on our lives, just like He had a call on Paul's life. Let's back up to the scripture. Go back to the scripture that we started with as we wrap this thing up. So Paul, he goes before the governor. He goes before the kings. He finally makes his way to Rome. And as he is in Rome, he is in this house and God has afforded him this opportunity to minister to the believers there. And like the scripture says, he was there and they called him and he was with the leading men of the Jews and they came together. And again, Paul doing what Paul does. He began to proclaim to them the word of God. Then he quotes the prophet Isaiah. And this is important for us. At verse 25, it says this. In chapter 28, verse 25, it says this. And when they did not agree with one another, they began leaving after Paul had spoken one parting word, the Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to your fathers. Go to the people and say, you will keep hearing but will not understand. And you will keep seeing but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. And with their ears they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and I would heal them therefore let me know to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles they will also listen Paul quotes the prophet tells them remember God said that his people would be so dull that they would not hear him now let us be careful. Many of us are in the church and the preachers and the teachers herald God's word over and over again. We have ears physically, but we don't hear. Our hearts have become hardened to the word. See, this was a hard saying for the Jews. That's why many of them went away because they did not want to hear what God was saying. When you hear God's word, it causes us to change. Our subject again is committed to your call. When you are committed to your call, God will cause you to change. Paul was telling them that you must hear God's word. And when you hear God's word, you must be willing to receive it. What is God speaking to your heart today? What is God showing you today that you must be willing to change? See, God has blessed us with uh, Paul. He's blessed us with the apostle who is the most prolific writer in the New Testament. Amen? Amen. But you have a life to live. Paul is, uh, the Lord has given you a story. And your story is not Paul's story. We've looked at Acts. Acts is not the history of Paul. Acts is not the biography of Paul. Acts is about Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Acts is about lifting up the name Jesus above all things. So in our individual lives, what are we willing to lift Jesus up above? When I talk about being committed to your call, you have to understand that you are called. You have a purpose. And know that purpose. And when you know that purpose, 
You ask God to show you how to walk in that purpose. But it's going to take commitment. At the beginning, I told us that commitment takes action. Commitment takes effort. Our level of commitment to Christ equals our level of sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice to serve God? Are you willing to, to sacrifice an evening so that you can go to Bible study? Are you willing to sacrifice getting up a little earlier so that you can spend some time with Jesus? Are you willing to sacrifice during football season, the 10 o'clock game, amen? Are you willing to sacrifice your little pet peeves, amen, your little stuff, so that you can serve? Are you willing to sacrifice, amen? Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 12, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. See, the problem with a living sacrifice is that we sometimes crawl down off the altar. Oh, God, I'm going to give you my all. Oh, wait a minute, I don't know about that. You tell me they was over this video. No, God, I, 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 I'm in this. I'm going. I'm, oh, no, no, you didn't tell me we met at that time. Oh, no, God, I'm going to study your word. Oh, no, you didn't tell me I was going to read Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all that. I like Psalms and Proverbs. Amen. Amen. Uh, <laughs> God, I'm, I'm willing to forgive. God, I'm ready to forgive. Forgive me. Well, you know, hold a hard heart toward this person. I'm willing to forgive. Well, you know, you that person ain't been here around you. I'm willing to forgive. Then God brings that person right to you. Yeah. Are you willing to forgive now? Wait a minute, God didn't tell me I was going to see him. Yeah. You, you tell me I was going to have to deal with them. See, commitment is equal to what you're willing to sacrifice. Are you willing to sacrifice your preacher conference? I often say when I have to drive a little way to church that uh, God didn't call me to convenience. He called me to commitment. If you're looking for convenience uh, in your walk with Christ, if you're looking for everything to line up the way you want it, then uh, you need to listen to Jesus' words when he tells you a wise person counts the cost. A wise builder counts the cost before he begins to build. Yet, if he starts building without counting the cost, he may find himself unable to finish what he 